This talk was originally presented at Wellesley College in June 2022 as part of the conference Hidden Nabokov. I thank Ruth Rogers, Adam Weiner, and the entire conference team for including me in this event. The invitation to present gave me the opportunity to revisit Pale Fire and consider both the evident and subtle ways that Nabokov's writing has informed the creation of my Shadow Quartet. Between 2017 and 2021, I created these four bookworks, Shadow Still Life, Graffiti, Incidental Music, and Travelogue. As an artist, I work with the book form. The form allows me to integrate my images and text into interactive structures. Time, sequence, folding, and unfolding are all key aspects of the book. Each piece is hand printed and hand bound in very small editions. The Shadow Quartet is an artist book variation on the long poem format. Each piece is a canto. In the late afternoon of July 2nd, 2017, a cedar waxwing flew into one of our picture windows and died. This fatality triggered the memory of the first line from the poem in Pale Fire and was a catalyst in making the first canto. In Shadow Still Life, I was directly and consciously informed by Pale Fire, exploring the physical form of the book and the imagery prompted by Nabokov's writing. We had moved to our new home in the summer of 2016, and my partner was building our studios. Thus, I didn't have access to my usual art making options. I also had new window views looking out onto the edge of a heavily treed escarpment, much like living in a tree house. My home has long been the source for my imagery, so moving was significant and I had to embrace the change. Pale Fire became the catalyst for a new body of work. My instinct was to work with the corporeal nature of the event, and thus I turned to the physical book, the literal source of the poetic prompt. I scanned the first canto and then created an image file of these layered pages. The visual layering of the words is much like my memory of Pale Fire, where the text is not a disembodied quote, but rather is physical letter forms and paper surface. My desire was to create an elegy to the waxwing, and Nabokov's imagery of the poet as the shadow was an entry. I conceived of the visual surface as a resting space for the body of the waxwing. Creating the image required a series of experiments, and I began as I usually do, quite literally. Then I respond, and the work begins to take its own form. The next step was to acknowledge the physical remains of the waxwing and bring that into the piece. One attempt recreated a blinding quality of light, another literal approach that didn't work as I envisioned. As I was able to see all the components of the still life, the stilled bird, the layered text, the shadow, I was able to resolve the visual conversation between my memory of pale fire, the fatal event, and the reality of regarding the body of this specific waxwing. Ultimately, the image that brought together all the elements in the least gruesome and objectifying manner felt like the right starting point. This image achieved my goals and is part of the second set of image spreads in Shadow Still Life. The body of the cedar waxwing appears twice in Still Life. These two images are constructions, while all the others in the work are still lifes of a single situation. The construction aspect in the first instance, which we just saw, occurred during the preparatory stages for making the photograph. The second image that includes the waxwing is a digital construction made by layering together multiple files. The image of the waxwing lying supine focused too much on the fact that this is a corpse. I wanted to create a different type of shadow, a silhouette of the physical form. So I added a new layer of a window view. 
and then integrated the two images by creating a mask which removed the wax wing and revealed the window view. The body becomes an absence. In addition to the image making, I had been writing and wanted to integrate my writing into the surface, so I created a visual ground of shadowed and dense text. And then my words are layered in, on top in white. This poem is written from the bird's perspective, and it is here that we realize that this piece is a prequel. It tells the story of the cause, the source of the death, the fatal falsity of our reflected world. The next set of images shows the final form of the bookwork. Still Life is a small, contained piece. Initially, it feels like a standard pamphlet. But when opened, the unfolding is a reveal. This is a gatefold or two-sided piece. The imagery also reveals a doubling. We look at the view from our window and see our window suspended in the tree, looking back at us. The four edges of the closed pamphlet open to become the gutters of two separate and independent gathering of page spreads. The structure reinforces the theme of doublings and reflections and permits the viewer to construct their own pairings. Shadow still life represents a shift in the content of my practice. My previous attention to ephemeral light conditions and qualities of illumination now focuses on the presence of the shadow. Window imagery has long figured in my work, but with the influence of pale fire, the window begins to have new psychological implications as the framed space of dramatic interactions. My work is primarily visual, but text has often been an element. With this piece, I begin a concerted commitment to including my own writing, and here's the poem. Before I was Nabokov's shadow, I was a bright flash. My darting flight performed your picture window spectacle. Flitting towards a false audience of glassy trees, my winged hit sounded the final percussion. Your sympathetic vibration, my stilled life. While working on still life, I had been gathering images and fragments of text, all related to imagery prompted by the first canto in Pale Fire, and Canto too evolved from this source. I was drawn to the potential of the long poem format, but instead of constructing one physical piece, I decided upon the open-ended structure of each canto as a separate bookwork. The title of each canto celebrates an undervalued art genre. This is consistent with my long-standing commitment to the poetic potential of the overlooked and dismissed aspects of our daily lives. Graffiti began with the discovery of a serial graffiti piece in an underpass in Rochester, New York. I was fascinated by the representation of a creature in flight locked into a static wall. My photographic record of this discovery was the starting point for a series of layered images. The doublings now manifest in a cinematic sequencing of images of birds. Graffiti is an accordion structure. By making a separate book structure for each canto, 
I was able to explore related themes, but allow each distinct piece its own image, text, and structural integrity. While I was layering the images of the graffiti and actual birds, I was struck by the counterpoint of the images. When we flip graffiti to its second side, we enter the musical component of the piece. I had selected three piano pieces that used two interacting voices. I scanned the musical notation and then collapsed each piece into a single representation, creating a visual performance. The spreads can be experienced as individual images, or the piece can be expanded and create a pseudo animation. The paper support becomes the architectural element acting as the wall. Each side of graffiti is a visual record of a fleeting instant. Birds fly by. The murmur of musical notes fades away. In still life, the, rest, the reference to Nabokov is conscious and explicit. Graffiti carries forward the imagery of the stilled bird and affirms the use of a four canto long poem. In the third canto, Incidental Music, the reference to pale fire manifests in the formal structure and the psychological impact of a polyphonic form. Pale fire structure plays with the nature of literary components. The book artist Clifton Metter has suggested that pale fire is much like an artist book in the way that the foreword, long poem, commentary and end notes interact to subvert the function of these literary conventions. This confounding of expectations fascinates me. Incidental music is about shifting visual and psychological states. At first, the structure seems to be a straightforward codex. But upon opening reveals a cascade of nested accordion fold structures. Incidental music began with making photographic records of sunlight progressing through a space. The pages fill with shad light and shadow, and a brief balancing act is performed midway through. We are aware that we stand outside the action, watching. The window image as the dynamic element reoccurs, this time with the implication of the voyeur. In making the initial models, I continued with the accordion structure as used in graffiti and tried to find a way to integrate my text components into the imagery. It was only when I acknowledged that these elements were distinct and should have their discrete space that I was able to resolve the structure. The image accordion hovers over and almost obscures the poem and soundscape components awaiting detection below. The poem is a variation on the vill villanelle. Then enter stage right, lured by the prelude and fugue state. Flood of late sunlight, shadow play fixed and anchored in stage fright. Or trace flickering flight, patterns of daydreams, bemused state. The vanishing self slips out of sight and seeks a new story. Of fast shifting light, of paper still white, a muse state. Pleated pages expand, unbound from the walls, to enter stage right, renewed state. The blind embossed soundscape floats within the uppermost folds. 
the images, poems, and the folded structure all exist independently, each permitted to play out their own rhythm, logic, and integrity, creating an ostinati of sorts. Incidental music bridges one scene to the next. In the final canto, there is an echo of pale fire. In the constructed realities of poetic imagery that form the chronicle of life's passage. Shadow travelogue is a travel monologue about two parallel and inevitable journeys. The daily journey we take through the cycle of a day. And the lifelong journey we embark upon from the moment we gain awareness. The awareness of our own mortality. This piece combines imagery and text into a relatively straightforward codex structure with alternating solid pages of photographic imagery and translucent pages of sparse text. Held by covers that form a reflected bridge. The individual images are constructions, convincing in their illusion, but impossible in reality. The private world hovers about to fall. Travelogue evolved from my long-standing ambivalence towards travel. The world we visit is framed by our window view. We are always inside, gazing out, the contained viewer. This is the journey of a reluctant pilgrim. Travelogue references the 14 stations of the cross. I'm an atheist and do not subscribe to any formal belief system, but I was raised within the Catholic religion and have witnessed the persuasiveness of these life arc narratives. The 14 stations take the observant through key events in a life journey, from knowledge of impending death to the final resting stage. I've created my own title and image for each station and offer this secularized version. In Travelogue, the path that is followed is the path from room to room, from window view to window view. Interestingly, the term stanza has its root in the Italian for station. Each image is a stanza, each poem is a station. Images of journals, household and house-like elements, and my poetry follow a sinuous path through the unfolding page spreads. This is an enlarged view of the poem for Station 14, Residue. Travelogue resolves in a sonnet about beginnings. As we approach the end of my talk, I will return to the beginning and further explore how the unfolding book can reveal our perceptual constructions and the potential of false or double readings. The poem for Station 1 flows across the gutter of an image of a journal. Then we discover that the journal splits at the gutter and opens out. A single poem becomes two, telling the same story, but from two perspectives. Station one is entitled Memento Mori and offers two attitudes towards the finite nature of our lives. In the second stanza, the poem initially reads, 
and we rouse from the yawning night, a dream of Medusa, a dawning fright, living a long life, laughing at the mirror, the crone faces her choice, the unfurling paths of change and age, a solitary life and invisibility. Or when we open up the journal and split the page, the left-hand poem becomes, and we rouse from a dream of Medusa, living a long life, laughing at the mirror, her choice, a solitary life. Thank you for your time and attention and the opportunity to share this body of work with you. I invite you to experience the four cantos as an interactive digital artwork, which is available on my website.